Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com/get100 and use code get100. That's code get100 at prizepicks.com/get100. For a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Hello, Alistair here, or I guess Tulsha, since the cat is out of the bag, as it were. Though, I do really prefer the name Alistair, as it harkens back to some very pleasant times. I'm sure you're wondering how it might be possible that I could be Tulsha when Tulsha existed before me and, in large part, influenced my journey. And... Perhaps you try to make it make sense by assuming that Tulsha must be some sort of title, which I have ascended to. This is not the case. I have always been Tulsha, and Tulsha has always existed. This may be a little difficult for you to comprehend, but I will try my best to break it down in a way that you might understand. Everything that ever happened or ever will happen is the result of something else. There are no exceptions. Even the outer gods must start from something. You see, as Tulsha, my very existence is truly infinite. I always exist and, as such, always know everything that ever was, ever is, or ever will be. As I said before, everything must have a beginning, and I am no different. What makes me unique is I had to enact that genesis myself. I would say that it allowed me to choose, but when you're omniscient, you understand that there really is no such thing as choice. Even when you think you have decided something, it is what you always decided. In my case... I found within my boundless knowledge quite a special pair of beings, one Evangeline Adams and her cat Alistair. They had a bond unlike any other. I suppose for lack of words to properly explain to you, let's just say it made me envious. I wanted to experience such a bond and, as it so happened, there was one single universe in which... There was no Evangeline and no Alistair. This would be where I place my start. In order to allow things to play out properly, I could not be as myself. After all, my mere presence is enough to incinerate everything around me. What this required was to plant a seed of myself, as it were. A version of me without all of my power. This, of course, meant that I must place pieces of my power along my path in order to become myself. Yes, the body parts of Tulsha were those pieces. They were all placed precisely where time required so that I would acquire them. For some, that meant placing them in places outside the normal flow of time. And for others, it meant putting them where another being would find them and unknowingly deliver them in proper order. The most important piece of all, though, 
would be the first to be absorbed. The piece known as my arm took the form of a staff taken up by a cult devoted to my power. They used it in many rituals and sought to use it to manifest my power in the world. I aided them in their goal, but not in the way that they thought. I whispered to their leader through flame, telling him that there would be a cat that must serve as my vessel. But in order for that to happen, they would need to forge my power into a somewhat different form. I gave them the necessary rituals to turn the staff into a being made of my energy, which took the shape of Evangeline. This Evangeline adopted my cat self and raised me in the manner which I desired. As with all good things, this too had to come to an end. Once the purpose had been fulfilled and the time had come for my journey of ascension, Evangeline went back to the cult and reverted into the form of the staff. From there, Alistair sought to return Evangeline to himself as per design. He tracked down the cult and, after I immolated all in his way, he absorbed the staff, never knowing that he reunited with his Evangeline in that moment. It is quite the bitter and tragic story, I know, but take some solace that I had the chance to go through it for myself. Even with knowledge of everything, there is still nothing quite like experiencing something firsthand. Just know that this, as with everything else, is exactly as it ever was. Here is to the hope that time will allow you to feel a bond like that. Dear Diary, we won. Everyone is safe. Except for them. They're both gone. I'm so tired right now. I'll write down some more after I rest. I'm not going to forget anything this time. Victor. Dear Diary, it's been a few weeks since it happened. Everyone in the organization was really kind and encouraging about my raps while they were still weak and looked sick. They've recovered enough now to properly transform me again, but that's about all they can do. They can't make shapes or, or shoot out or anything anymore. I think when I took that last shot at Haster, they must have taken the brunt of the power for me. But it was worth it to show that jerk that he wasn't going to win. I guess it's all just as well, since I talked with Sarah, and she agreed that it would be best if I moved to being part of the internal side of things now. It would be too dangerous for me to go out like I was before, especially since I wouldn't have my backup. She said I would be a great consultant, and that I would find my new place here soon enough and that I could stay in the apartment, too. It feels much emptier now. I'm still not ready to write about them yet. I'm sure it'll come soon. Love, Victor. Dear Diary, After talking a lot with Manrose, he took me to a floor in the organization I'd never seen before, with the nicest kitchen you can imagine and a huge cafeteria. Apparently, he never thought to mention we had a full dining floor. Or I guess maybe he just made one for me? He's always so vague. But I talked to Sarah, and among other things, I'm going to be the official chef of the organization. I get to feed all of the agents, members, and residents. And since the Stout Hearts can provide whatever fresh ingredients I need, I can try out tons of new dishes and stuff. It's really neat. Kind of on that topic, I've been working very hard to remember the things that the monk had knowledge about, and I'm getting very close to training my body and mind to the levels he achieved. 
I can feel the raps encouraging me sometimes, since they can only help me out in minor ways now. But I believe I'll soon be adept enough so that I no longer need to eat. It's been much easier here with the blank flesh that the stout hearts provide and even those strange things I eat on quarrels. But it would be so much nicer to not have to worry about it anymore altogether. Also, I've started to take an early afternoon walk every day outside of the organization. I guess I must have picked up a few habits from Larry. Evangeline and Shadow use their machines to help find a few worlds similar to my dark well, so I like to go out, enjoy the fresh air, and people watch. It's really relaxing, and it helps me feel like a normal person. I know after everything that's happened that I'm not, but it, it's still nice to feel that way. I mentioned all of that to say that I've made a brand new friend, a small black kitten who I saw in an alleyway during my daily walk. I called out to him, and he came over and ate a bit of food from my hand and started purring really loudly. And even though Sarah, Tanasha, and a few of the others gave me some funny looks for doing it, I decided to take him home and name him Albert. I'm about 90% sure Al isn't a Dreamlands cat, even though he can go missing for a while sometimes. But it's nice to have him around. I made him a little green collar, and Al really loves all the same dishes that I used to make for him. I've tried for months now to understand just what happened to him that day. The big green pillar of flame, his gooey, frail little body, the voice of his imaginary friend. It seemed to make a lot more sense in the moment than it does to me now. And I still don't know how or why Alistair became or always was Tulsha. When I talked to Sarah about it, she mentioned something about causality time loops and bootstrap paradoxes and a bunch of other terms I'm not familiar with. It's really confusing. I guess it's kind of fitting that he didn't really know what was happening either until the end or the beginning or something. I just hope that if he's still out there, that he knows that I miss him. Love, Victor. Dear Diary, I've thought about this for a very long time, and I'm going to give it to Luth. I know now that I'm never going to be able to eat from my mother again. Maybe, maybe he can see something other than those horrible memories. Something that proves she loved me. And if not, I'll know he'll at least protect me from anything else. Some things are just too hard to handle. Victor. Dear Diary, It's been a little over the year since the big battle. Stuff has remained mostly quiet since then, with just a few hiccups on the dread tech side of things. But Haster hasn't tried to fight back again, from what I've been told. And I think that the new DDA team will be safe until they get their bearings. Barum, Chandira, and Gerbo have all been training this whole time, and Sarah said they're ready to take on some field assignments. I've been helping out with improving their unarmed and melee weapon fighting skills, and I also made some more of those injections and taught Gerbo how to use them. Luth has been really helpful with guiding me to the right agents to make them with. It feels good to be a useful part of the team again, even if I'm not going out there myself. And Albert has been wonderful, just the sweetest cat I could ask for. But with all this preparation for the new DDA, I've caught myself pondering on Julian a lot more recently. It wasn't even until last week when I couldn't find Al in the apartment that I realized I had never actually tried to go in Julian's room. And when I did, it was still locked with that paranoid magic spell he used. I actually went to ask Luth if maybe he could remember which spell it was so I could get someone to help break it. But he said that he didn't know because Julian's the only agent 
in the crypt that he's never feasted on. Apparently, Julian left instructions that only I was permitted to do so. I mean, I guess it makes sense. He never did like the idea of crypt folk anyway. I took a small piece to hold on to, but now it doesn't feel like the right time to eat it. I'm not sure when that might be, but I know it's not now. Love, Victor. Dear Diary, Janice passed away last night. He had really been doing a lot better the last couple of years. I even got him to come to my apartment for dinner with me a few times, and he seemed to enjoy himself, and he wasn't nervous or anything. But he was gone when Gerbo found him in bed this morning. Gerbo said that he probably died peacefully in his sleep, but I'm, I'm not so sure. I think it was the nightmares. They had taken such a toll on his body, and I bet they'd finally caught up with him. I still remember the nightmares, how I felt like I was dying every single night before I got my bracelet, a gift from the Cervantes Julian. I sometimes forget it's there, but never for very long, and I never forget about my Julian. Things weren't usually easy and were actually really hard at a lot of times, but I still miss him so much. And I wonder how much he might miss me if things had been different, if I were the one who was gone. It's hard to think about. Love, Victor. Dear Diary, the memories are too much. I don't know what I'm seeing or where they all came from. Whatever it is, it doesn't feel like Julian. I can hardly write my thoughts when my mind clears. It comes in such intense flashes and waves and nothing seems to make sense. They're strange beings, visions of another world. I can see them in the room sometimes, but then they're gone. Whatever it is, I think it's close. I, I have to find it. I have to know what's there. Why was this in Julian's mind? Dear Diary, for weeks, I've been checking different worlds on my walks, looking for clues, and I finally found something. I've seen flashes, a, a glimpse of another dark well, and this one matches it perfectly, every detail. I've checked and double-checked. I know the place I'm looking for is on this world. I'm setting sail tomorrow. I asked Sarah for a sabbatical, some rest, a vacation, I know she could tell it was something else, but she let me go anyway. I've got supplies, too. I've packed warm clothes and visited Juliet for some of those tea herbs. It's cold there. I know it is. I can feel it already. It's on the other continent, though. I've gotten a job up on a boat in the galley. They think I'm a tabaxi. It'll get me close enough to go to the rest of the way on foot. I know I'll find it. Victor. Testing. One, two. Okay, it's working. It's it's too hard to write in this cold, so I'm using something Yamno gave me a while back, called a recorder. After walking four days, I found the ruins. The moon is out now, illuminating everything. I can see flashes of strange creatures walking through different hallways and rooms. And the, the flashes, they match the crumbling walls of the buildings that used to be here. I can see Julian, too. He's guiding me where I need to go, with that stupid grin on his face he always has when he knows something I don't. I know he'll tell me when I've gotten there. This is it. This is it. This is... This is a... A library. This is a library. Uh, I... I... There's... There's all these... There's all these boxes around. They... They all look the same, but... No, I see it. I see it. There, there's there's a human there's a human handing handing that one that one he's handing that one to some weird alien thing where where is it okay okay here it is okay uh, it's, a, it's a book a book okay I, I can't read it it's it looks like it looks like those weird notes that Julian was writing. What's, uh, what's this? 
Some kind of rock in here. It's it's Julian. I see him. I. It, what what is he saying? That doesn't sound like Julian. Message begins. Gumdrop level clearance required. Hello. This crystal's engrams have been attuned to your mind. If you are a member of the Darkwell Detective Agency, this will be a painless process. If you're not, well, the magic imbued in the crystal will have made you a drooling, mind-locked cretin. Not sorry. You shouldn't be here. And this is a mercy compared to the contents of this crystal. Listed are a recounting of events that have taken place by a group of three members of the DDA. Victor Stodge, a ghoul monk. Alistair, a dreamland's cat of great power. And myself. You can review them at your own discretion. They will be imprinted in your mind. Now. These are the Darkwell Chronicles. From my perspective. My name is, or was, Dr. Julian Cottage. I'm deceased now, or my body is dead. After my body was damaged beyond saving, my mind was yanked, so to speak. I awoke on a ship, greeted by alien beings known as the Great Race. They greeted me in their own way. They don't speak like normal beings do. Sensory input is different with their race. A common human analogy would be seeing smells or tasting sound. Something like that. It was about this time I found that I was in a very new, very alien body one of their bodies. They switched out our minds. I don't know what happened to the other one, but it was a sacrifice to preserve my mind. This great race, the Yith, heard me in the void. They knew of my knowledge that I had attained, knowledge of the Tablet of the Gods. They coveted this, as well as my altered brain over the course of what has happened. They offered me a task to help their minds and bodies adapt into a sturdier nature against their war with a race of cephalopods. Currently dwindling in number, this mind swapping was a tactic of their own self-preservation to learn and adapt. Their collected knowledge is too much to absorb in several lifetimes, but I did try. For years I tried, like a sponge. After our partnership was complete, I left, booted back into a human body, not my own body. I don't know who this person was, they never said but they were about to get on the wrong end of a knife. So, after reducing the attackers to liquid and pulp, I gathered myself. There is, uh, was, much to do. I'm very far back now, before the end of Darkwell as we knew it. We will lay the groundwork here. Manrose the elevator, the silver keys. Someone must make that deal. I just didn't know it was me. The seal room as well. That'll need to be done. I'll find the others as well. Make sure everything is in order. I'm not Julian Cottage. That being's gone. I'm... I'm something else now. We need to be ready, ready to begin, ready to stem the tide against all the forces that could turn us all into 
insane whelps at a mere utterance. Seize our dimensions and their expanding dominion or just rewrite the cosmos itself. We're a drop in a vast ocean of possibilities. The others will sense that ripple. I just hope they don't send a tidal wave back. To Victor and Alistair, if you're listening to this, stay strong and stay afraid. These will keep you alive for a while. These tenants. Help the new members if you're still around. There are more rooms to explore here. You just need to ask Manrose. Victor, you never even went to the test kitchen. I'd like you to go there. I think you would like it a lot. Alistair, there's a key to the pocket library that Julian had. It's right in the corner of your eye. You just need to look very closely. I read all of the tomes already. They were pretty interesting things in there. Not just the books. Just don't take anything out. Trust me on that. I've delayed too long. There's lots to do. Timelines to keep steady. Deals to honor. Prices to be paid. If you are a new member of the DDA, welcome. Welcome to the greatest burden of fighting and surviving the screaming, writhing unknown. No pressure. Sincerely, the custodian. P.S. Did no one really ask who cleaned up all the mess that happened there? Funny what gets overlooked. What? He was there all along. Julian started the DDA. I can't see anything anymore. All the... All the visions are gone. It's just the ruins now. I'm gonna go home. Dear Diary, I'm almost home. I was able to to take a ship back and make it back to the other dark well. And uh, I'm almost there. I've had a little bit of time to think. And I'm really, really happy. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to say to him. But I don't really want to wait. Manrose, I want to I go see the custodian. Oh, of course, Victor. Going down. <laughs>